Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, so who here is uh, familiar with the epigrams on programming by Alan Parlis? Ooh, not that many people actually. So, so I do recommend you go home and read them. It's super entertaining, right? Uh, so in this paper, Parlis wrote more than 100 epigrams about computing. But my, my favorite epigram is number 31 that says that simplicity does not precede complexity but follows it. And uh, as you'll see, uh, my talk is in some ways related to this epigram. So a key activity when we design software is to we develop models of the system we want uh, to build, right? And these models are abstractions that allow us to quickly explore design alternatives. And to develop these abstractions, we can use very different levels of formality. For example, we can just sketch some informal diagrams in a piece of paper, but we can also use uh, rigorous mathematical notations to specify them. And the advantage of using these uh, rigorous notations is that given the precise semantics, uh, they enable us to perform a rigorous analysis of uh, the properties of our system instead of just relying on informal arguments. And uh, for many years, the, the area of formal methods has been developing languages and tools for rigorous software design. But unfortunately, many of these um, formal methods are quite complex, and so realistically, they can only be used in the design of uh, very critical software. But however, in the, in the last decades, I think some simpler, lightweight uh, formal methods have emerged. And these uh, lightweight methods have languages that are based on simple mathematical concepts, and they offer automated analysis and exploration tools, and I think they made formal methods more cost-effective. So in this talk, I'll briefly present two of these formal methods, uh, TLA plus and Alloy. Of course, I will not have time to present all the details of these languages, but uh, at the end of this talk, I hope I have convinced you that they are indeed uh, simple enough to use, uh, not only in design of critical software, but maybe in design of everyday software, even software with uh, complex uh, configurations. So my definition of configuration is very broad. So a configuration is just a set of conditions or parameters that affect the software behavior and that remains constant throughout execution. So of course, when we design a system, we should take these configurations into account. And ideally, we should analyze the behavior of the system for all possible configurations because we could have some weird bugs that occur only in some of them, right? But the problem is that uh, complex configurations can be difficult to specify and even difficult to just enumerate. And hopefully these uh, lightweight methods with uh, their simple languages, their automatic analysis can help us do, do that, right? So I'll now give some uh, examples of configurations with increasing levels of complexity. So for example, when we design a concurrent algorithm, a configuration can just be the number of processes. Uh, or in this illustration of a shared bonded buffer, we have the number of producers, the number of consumers, and the size of the buffer. So three numbers, three integers, right? Uh, another example is distributed protocols that typically assume that the network has a specific configuration, right? So some protocols assume that the network is fully connected. Sometimes it has a more specific shape, like a ring or a tree. Uh, and sometimes they have a distinguished node like this orange here that plays a special role. Okay? Yet another example are software product lines, right? Where many variants of a software supporting diff different features are engineered together at once, right? In these uh, systems to model variability, we use these uh, di diagrams, which are called feature models. Uh, and these are hierarchic diagrams that capture what are the valid features uh, and feature combination, basically the variants of the system. So uh, to support uh, expressive logics and at the same time support automatic analysis, these lightweight formal methods have to impose some restrictions, right? So for example, in TLA plus and Alloy, we must impose uh, maximum scope or bound in the domain of analysis. Uh, for example, if you are designing a concurrent algorithm with these methods, we'll only be able to verify properties for a given maximum number of processes. But note that this is still vastly superior to testing because all possible behaviors for all possible configurations inside this scope will be uh, uh, analyzed, right? And moreover, I think most of us agree with uh, something that is called the small scope hypothesis that states that most flaws and most bugs can be caught with very simple small examples. And thus, in most cases, this exhaustive bounded analysis will suffice and provide us strong correctness guarantees. 
So the running example I use in this talk is a simple distributed protocol whose goal is to form a spanning tree in a network. This is an echo protocol where nodes receive echoes from messages they have sent before. And it was initially proposed by NS Chang in the 80s. There are many variants or some variants of this protocol that has been proposed later, but here I use the original version from Chang. So the protocol works on specific configurations of networks, namely connected and directed graphs, with a distinguished node that uh, will act as the initiator of the protocol. So the original paper presents the algorithm with a set of rules written in natural language, and these rules dictate how the protocol starts and how should a node react when it receives a message. So in particular, the initiator node is assumed to start the protocol by sending explorer messages to all its neighbors. And when a node receives an explorer uh, message, and that explorer is the first to arrive at the node, the sender is marked as its, as its parent, and the explorer messages are sent to all other neighbors. And if the explorer message is uh, not the first to arrive, or the nodes have no more neighbors, uh, an echo is sent back. Uh, and when a node receives an echo, it memorizes the sender, and when all the echoes to previously sent messages have been received, an echo is sent back to the parent. And the protocol finishes when the initiator uh, received all the echoes that he is expecting. And when the protocol finishes, this parent relationship uh, is supposed to define a spanning tree of the, of the network that is root that initiator. And this is the key property that we want to verify that is correct for all possible network configurations. So being a, a distributed algorithm, I'll first describe how it can be modeled and analyzed with TLA+, which is nowadays the most popular framework for designing distributed systems. So TLA plus is a formal specification language. It was introduced by Leslie Lamport in the 90s, and it has since been applied by several companies like Amazon or Microsoft in the design and analysis of real distributed systems. So TLA plus is based on the temporal logic of actions, uh, which is a, a logic I'll briefly explain in a few moments. And TLA plus uh, specifications can be automatically analyzed with the TLC model checker. So TLA plus is an example of a state-based formal method. In these methods, the system is described with some sort of state machine. And to describe the state of this machine, we use variables, right? Uh, and these variables, the value of these variables will, will change as a result of possible events in the system. As I mentioned before, the models are abstractions, right? Abstractions of the system we want to build. So to simplify formal reasoning, uh, these variables should hold simple mathematical values. For example, we can use natural numbers or sets or functions uh, to describe the state of our system. So at an early phase of design, we don't want to care about the details of programming languages like, pro uh, uh, like overflows or arithmetic overflows. This is important, of course, but it's the, 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 these issues should be addressed in a later phase of development. So for example, to model a clock, we can use just two natural numbers, one for the hour, another one for the minutes. So TLA plus uses temporal logic to specify the expected properties of a system. So temporal logic is the most popular logic to specify this kind of behavioral properties. And it has this logic has some so-called temporal operators that allow us to check the truth value of a formula along a uh, trace. And the key operators are the box, or always, that checks if a formula is true in all future states, and the eventually, or the diamond, that checks if a formula is true in some future state. And model checkers are tools that can automatically verify if a temporal logic formula holds in a finite state uh, machine model of a system. And if the property is not valid, they return a counterexample, which is a trace where the property fails, right? And these counterexamples are extremely useful because they can help us detect and fix issues with our design. So here is an expected property of our clock specified in, with temporal logic. So this is an invariant stating that it is, it is always true that the hour will be a number between 1 and 12. This is an example of a safety property stating that nothing terribly wrong will happen with our clock. The second formula states another very desirable uh, clock property, namely that we'll eventually reach the lunch break. 
Uh, this is an example of a liveness property that forces our clock to do s to do something good, right? It has to do something to reach this goal, right? So, uh, standard temporal logic can be used to specify which traces satisfy the expected properties, right? But it's not easy to use the standard temporal logic to specify uh, the system behavior itself, that is, the set of all possible execution traces of a state machine. And in many formal methods, a different language is used to specify that. So, and to make things simpler, and this we go back to the epigram 31, right? So to make things simpler, Lampart extended temporal logic with the so-called actions, creating the temporal logic of actions, or TLA, right? And with TLA, we can use the same logic to specify both the system and the properties of the system. So we just need one logic for everything. So an action is a formula where variables can appear with a prime, and the primed variable uh, denotes the value of the variable in the next state. And using an action, we can, with a very compact declarative notation, specify a whole set of transitions in our system. And by combining actions with the always temporal operator, we can specify all its expected traces. So here is how we could specify the behavior of the clock with TLA, right? So first, we have an action that describes the transitions where the hour changes. So the first conjunct here uh, specifies that the hour hand can only change when the minute hand is at 59. And this is a guard that restricts when is this action enabled. And then, when the action of occurs, we have an effect on the state, as specified in the next two conjuncts. So in the next state, the hour will move on to the next position, and the minute will go back to zero. Then we have an action to specify the transitions where only the minute changes, and this is specified in a similar way. We can also describe the initial state uh, with a formula, in this case a normal formula without any primes, right? For example, we can specify that the clock starts at 12 o'clock sharp. And finally, we can describe the full behavior of the clock with a temporal logic formula that states that in the first state, in it must be true, and then it is always the case that the system transitions either through an hours or a minute action, right? So to verify that our clock satisfies some property, we just need to check that all executions that conform to the clock specification also satisfy the expected property. More formally, we just need to check this implication here. So one of design techniques that is supported by TLA Plus is something called refinement. So a technique where we develop a system by incrementally adding detail, starting from very abstract specifications. And to check that a more concrete or more refined specification uh, still conforms to a more abstract specification, the latter must allow stuttering steps, that is, transitions where nothing happens, where all the variables keep their value. I'll explain this with the, with the clock example. So here is a more refined clock. So now we have also seconds. And here is the TLA specification of uh, this clock. So the previous specification was extended with a new action that specifies the transitions where the seconds change. And some more changes to the other, to the other actions. So to check that this new clock is indeed a clock, that is a refinement of the abstract clock that we had before, we need to check this implication. That is, all traces that satisfy this new spec also satisfy the previous abstract specification. However, this is not valid, right? Because the new action uh, of the more refined clock, where only the seconds change, has no counterpart in the abstract clock, because we, over there we always force the minutes to change, right? So in order to support refinement, a specific, the specification of the abstract clock should allow stuttering, that is, should allow the variables to keep their value. And in TLA, we are actually forced to allow these stuttering steps, and the logic has a special notation to extend an action with stuttering. So in particular, actions must be used inside this special square brackets operator. And this square bracket operator extends the action with stuttering automatically. So, having introduced the basic idea of specifying systems with the TLA logic, let's now give a bit uh, more detail about the concrete syntax of TLA plus language. So, it's a concrete language to specify the systems. And we'll develop our specification of the ECHO protocol. So, in TLA plus, uh, we have a distinction between two kinds of variables. So, they have rigid variables that are declared with the constants keyword, which are parameters of the system and that remain constant throughout execution. And this can be used to 
represent the configuration of our system, right? And we have flexible variables declared with the variables keyword that are the normal variables that change, that change value, right? And you can specify assumptions about the constants with the assumed uh, keyword. And by that, doing that, we can restrict the valid configurations, right? TLA plus is untyped. So when declaring a variable, we do not specify its type. And variables can hold any of the mathematical values I mentioned before, numbers, bools, sets, functions, but also some other derived values that can be encoded with, with functions. For example, you can have sequences encoded as functions from indexes to, to values, or records encoded as functions from field, uh, field names to values, right? So, to first I'll specify the configurations of our protocol. So I'll declare three constants for that. So node here uh, will be a set that contains the IDs of all the nodes in my network. And then I have a constant initiator that will contain the ID of the initiator. And then we have a constant uh, ADJ for adjacency that is a function that for each node returns its neighbors. Then we have to specify assumptions about this uh, configuration, namely that the network is undirected and disconnected, right? So first, for this we'll basically use uh, first-order logic uh, and the standard set theory operators, right? For example, this first constraint states that the initiator must be one of the nodes, right? And the second constraint makes sure that the function ADJ has the expected type, that is, is a function from nodes to sets of nodes. And here we use a special TLA syntax to denote the set of all possible functions from one set to another. So in the next two constraints, I use uh, an universal quantifier to constrain the network 12, no self loops, so no node n can be its own uh, neighbor, and to be undirected. So if y is a neighbor of x, then x is a neighbor of y. So in principle, we all know first order logic, right? And uh, I think we should understand uh, these constraints and be able to specify them. So to specify our last assumption that the network is connected, I will just require that all other nodes are reachable from the initiator because the network is undirected, right? And to do that, I'll first specify uh, what is the set of nodes that are reachable from a given node n. And to specify that, I need to use an auxiliary function defined recursively. And given this auxiliary specification, then we can easily state that all other nodes are reachable from the initiator. So these kind of reachability properties are very common when we deal with complex structures. Of course, we all know recursion, but there's, these properties are not that trivial to specify anymore in, in TLA. So to model the state of the protocol, I chose to declare three flexible variables. So I have parent, that is a function that for each node returns the respective parent, or a special constant known if the node still doesn't know who is the parent. We have received, that is a function that for each node returns the, sets of no the set of nodes from which it already receives uh, echoes. And finally, I have inbox, a function that returns the set of messages that each node currently has in its inbox. So notice that in TLA+, plus there are no special keywords or constructs to model nodes and the communication between them. We just have math, right? So we are, I'm using sets to model inboxes and the standard set operators to add or remove messages from, from the inboxes. And to represent messages, I will use tuples with a from and a type field, and the type is either explorer or echo. Uh, the specification of the echo protocol is given by the standard TLA formula here and below, where init is uh, the predicate that specifies the valid initial states. And next is an action that, sp that specifies the valid transitions. And of course, the system must be allowed to stutter. And action next specifies that the protocol can only evolve by two possible events at each node, right? Either receiving an explorer or receiving an echo. And this is specified using a standard existential uh, quantifier. Again, plain math, right? Ranging over all possible nodes and using two auxiliary actions to specify the respective events, right? So here is the specification of the init predicate. Well, I don't have time to show you all the details, but essentially this just specifies the initial value for all the, the variables, right? And here is the full specification of the receive explorer event. In this case, we have an action with several constraints that dictate how the next value of each variable is related to the current file value, right? 
Uh, for example, if the node still doesn't have a parent and an explorer is received, then the sender of the explorer will become the parent of the node, right? And the specification of the receive event is very, the receive echo message is very similar, I, I will not show it. So we, before verifying any expected properties, we have to validate our model, right? So this is very important to make sure that it's indeed specifying the expected behavior of the system, right? Otherwise, we can get into this junk in, junk, junk out mode where properties could be trivially true because the system is actually not doing anything or just doing something completely different from what we expect, right? But unfortunately, the TLC model checker has no great support for validation. But there are some techniques we can use to, to validate our spec, right? For example, a common technique is to write trivially false properties that will produce as counterexamples scenarios that we want to validate if uh, are indeed possible. For example, like we can specify a property stating that the protocol will never finish, okay? And hopefully this property will be false and the counterexample will be an execution where the protocol runs to completion, right? To verify a property with TLC, we must first instantiate all the constants that we declared in our model. That is, we must state for which specific configuration we want to check this property. So in this case, I want to see an execution scenario for a complete network with four nodes. So I will instantiate the constants accordingly, right? And then if we run TLC, we get the expected scenario. Uh, so TLC shows executions in this tabular textual format presenting for each state uh, the value of each variable, highlighting the ones that change the value. So this is the standard in most model checkers. And although useful, I think it's not always easy to understand what's going on, in particular if we have uh, very complex uh, structures. So after validating the model, we can verify expected properties, right? And the key correctness property is a safety invariant specified with the always temporal operator that states that when the protocol finishes, then the parent function defines a spanning tree root at the initiator. And this is again a reachability property, and again we'll use recursion to specify that, but I'll omit the details, okay? And here are the approximate types, times that TLC took in my machine to check the expected properties for complete networks with four, five, and six nodes. Uh, I'll also show the time to verify termination, uh, which is a desirable liveness property, but I didn't present the specification, okay? So verification is instantaneous. For four nodes, is super fast, very reasonable for five nodes, but it's already very slow for six nodes. And actually, it did not finish inside my timeout of one hour, so I, I set it a timeout of one hour. So to understand why verification is so slow in this last configuration, we must understand that TLC uses an explicit state model checking technique. It actually unrolls and explores all possible states of our system. And with six nodes, there are an awful lot of states to explore. So it's uh, super slow, okay? So as you have seen, TLC only verifies one configuration at a time, right? So right now we are very confident that the protocol works well for complete networks. Uh, but how can we be sure that it works well for all other configurations of the network? So in principle, we have to do it manually by specifying all possible configurations and run TLC separately for all possible configurations. But with up to four nodes, there are already 16 truly different networks, which are actually not that easy to enumerate manually. And I'm pretty sure most of us would miss a couple of them if we had to do that manually. And of course, this strategy will not scale for bigger scopes, right? For bigger networks. There are some techniques that we can use with TLA plus to verify all possible configurations at once. But unfortunately, they are a bit cumbersome and it's not always effective due to the explicit state model shaking technique of TLC. So if your configurations are simple, say just the number of processes in a concurrent algorithm, that is quite easy to do. And verification is extremely efficient. No excuses not to do it, right? But what can we do if we want to apply these kind of formal techniques in the design of systems with more complex configurations, right? Or in this case, to verify the protocol for all uh, networks with six nodes, right? So one, one possibility is to use alloy, right? Which is a formal method that was invented precisely to address the problem of designing complex structures. So Alloy was introduced by Daniel Jackson at MIT, and one of its features is an excellent support for validation, as I will show in a couple of minutes. 
So Alloy is based on relational logic, that is a logic that combines first-order logic with relational algebra operators, including, including some closure operators. And these closures will allow us to very easily specify reachability properties. The automatic analysis of Alloy specifications, as implemented in the Alloy Analyzer tool, is based on a symbolic model finding technique that does not explicitly enumerate uh, states and thus is uh, potentially very effective at exploring large sets of uh, structures, okay? So another nice thing about Alloy is that this language was designed for abstraction. In particular, all structures must be described with a single mathematical concept, which are relations, okay? And relations are just sets of tuples with the same length or arity. And we can declare relations of different arity in Alloy, right? For example, to represent functions, we can use binary relations with an extra constraint forcing each domain value to have exactly one related uh, uh, result. And to represent sets, we can use un unary relations, right? Um, so everything is a relation in Alloy, right? And this might be a, seem a bit restrictive at first, but uh, actually it puts us in a mindset where we are kind of forced to reason about our structures in a very abstract way, which I think is good for design, right? Uh, and another advantage is that since everything is a relation, right, we only need a few operators to manipulate relations. So the syntax and semantics of Alloy is very minimal, right? So in Alloy, the unary relations, the one that can be used to represent sets, are known as signatures. Signatures are declared with the keyword sig, and they can have a multiplicity attached that restricts the number of elements in the set. And signatures can also be declared as subsets or extensions of other signatures. And the relations of hierarchy, for example, binary relations, are known as fields, and they are declared inside the domain signature. And again, we can have a multiplicity constraint attached to the target signature to restrict the cardinality of the related elements. So here is a model of, our, uh, of the network configurations of our protocol. So likewise, in the TLA plus specification, I have a set node or signature node that contains all the nodes in the network. And I have a singleton uh, initiator that is uh, one node, right? That is the initiator of the protocol. And inside the node signature, I declare a binary relation ADJ for capturing the neighbors of each node. So that relates each node with its neighbors. So to specify assumptions about our structures, we do that inside facts in Alloy. Uh, and we must use this relational logic to specify them. So unlike TLA+, Alloy has a, a type system that can help us detect some basic specification errors. And uh, being an extension of first order logic, we have the usual quantifiers and the Boolean connectives. And in Alloy, they are written with English words, which I think make uh, specifications quite, quite readable. So relational logic has some extra operators, but not that many, in fact. So this is the full list of operators and constants in, in Alloy, right? So the binary operators are, with a very few exceptions, the set operators, union, intersection, difference, Cartesian product. So this is the standard things we all know. And we can check if one relation is a subset of another or if it's equal. But then the key operator is this dot, the dot join uh, composition that I'll present next. And for unary operators, we have several cardinality checks and we have the closures that I will also present next. And we have some constants uh, that I will not present. And so what does the dot join composition looks like. So uh, the idea is we have two relations and we can compose them with dot join to get a derived relation. So if you have a relation R relating A to B and a relation S relating B to C, we can compose them R dot S and we get a, a relation that directly goes from A to C, right? But since everything is a relation in a law, you can also compose a set or a variable with a relation, right? In particular, if you have a quanti quantified variable X that... Uh, uh, belongs to A. Uh, this quantified variable in Alloy is also a singleton unary relation, right? And we can compose it with R, and X dot R is the set of Bs that is related to this X. And if we have a binary relation R, then its transitive closure that is denoted with the caret operator can be used to, given an element, obtain all the elements that can be reached from R in one or more steps. For example, if you have the parent relationship, the closure of the transitive closure of parent is the ancestor relation. Okay. So here's how we could specify the valid configurations of our network. 
So in Allah, you can have very different styles to specify the constraints. For example, the, f the constraint that there are no self loops, I use a rather traditional first order style with a quantifier, stating that no node X can be contained in its own neighbors. And, but to specify that the network is undirected, I use a purely relational style or point-free style without any quantifiers. I just require that ADJ is equal to its converse. Okay? And finally, to specify that all other nodes must be reached from the initiator, I can use the closure operator. Right? So here I'm doing the closure of uh, ADJ. And uh, by doing that, I can easily determine the set of all nodes that are reachable from the initiator. And then I just uh, require all other nodes to be contained in this set. Uh, concerning analysis, the uh, all specifications can, be, can, both, can include both check and run commands. Right? So check commands verify if an assertion is true and return a counterexample if it's not. And uh, run commands try to find scenarios that satisfy some, some properties. And both scenarios and counterexamples uh, are instances of our model, and they assign a value to each declared relation, right? And to make uh, the analysis decidable, all these comments have a customizable scope that imposes a bound in the size of the domain. So one of the most popular features of Alloy is that instances can be depicted graphically using a customizable theme. So another popular feature is that you can ask for more instances. So you can ask for more counterexamples or more examples. And this is very useful because seeing different counterexamples can help us better figure out what is the problem with our spec. And it also implements something called symmetry breaking by default, meaning that it will only return truly different instances. So here's an example of a run command that asks for examples of networks with up to five nodes. So the first returned instance is a network with a single node, which of course is the initiator. If we press next, we get a network with three, two nodes. If we press next, we get one possible network with three nodes. And if we keep asking for more examples, we'll eventually get all possible networks, like this one with five nodes. So although the original like could also be used for behavioral design, it was a bit cumbersome, and many researchers start ex proposing extensions to the language to simplify that, uh, that task, right? And together with colleagues from University of Porto and from Monera in France, uh, around 10 years ago, we also started researching how, how could we extend Alloy to, to better support behavioral design, right? So at the time, we had TLA+, Plus, which was great for behavioral design. We had Alloy, that was great for structural design. And our idea was very simple. Let's create a mix of both. So we just created an extension that was called Electron, and uh, that essentially added temporal logic uh, to, to, to Alloy, right? And uh, later, this extension became the official version 6 of Alloy, which is the, the, the most recent version that you can download and use uh, nowadays, right? So in Alloy 6, we can declare mutable signatures and fields by using the keyword var, right? And to specify behavioral properties, we, have the, we can use temporal logic operators, including the always and eventually of uh, TLA, right? And it also has this prime operator of, the, uh, of TLA. And this allows us to specify the expected behavior of the system with a, with a temporal formula. But unlike TLA, so this prime can be used freely and stuttering is not mandatory. So we have to be a bit careful if we want to do refinement. But we do have uh, lots of freedom ab about how to specify behavior. And that can be quite good in some, in some cases, right? So to specify the behavior of our protocol, likewise in TLA+, Plus, I chose to declare three variables uh, uh, here, right? So one is a binary relation parent that uh, given a node returns if its parent, if any, right? And here I'm using multiplicity alone to clear clarify that this is a partial function here, right? So I don't need this special known constant that we have in TLA. And then we have a binary relation that registers no for each node from which neighbor it already received the echoes. And finally, the uh, ternary relation that for each node returns the messages in the inbox. And these messages are like pairs with a node and a type of message. And to specify the behavior, again, we use a very similar uh, constraint like we did in TLA+. Plus. So init is a predicate that characterizes the initial state. And then it's always true that the system evolves true next or stutter. So I have to explicitly state that the system can stutter. And next is, again, very similar to TLA. So we just say that uh, at each node, uh, either a receive explorer happens or a receive echo happens, right? Very similar. 
So using alloy relational algebra operators, we can have a very simple specification of the init predicate. So both parent and received are empty, right, initially. And then uh, the inbox, uh, we can use the, this arrow, which is the cross product, to easily state that uh, all the neighbors of the initiator have an explorer uh, in their inbox. And to specify the receive explorer event, and again, very similar to TLA+, but with alloy syntax, right? So I'll not go into the details, right? And the receive echo is again very, very similar. So the idea is the same. We use the primes to specify how the system evolves, right? So a big advantage of uh, Alloy 6 with respect to TLA plus is the support for validation. So we can ask directly for run commands. And in this case, I'm asking for any possible execution uh, of the protocol. And as usual, executions are depicted graphically. So when we have mutable structures, uh, we focus on one transition at a time using a split plane. And uh, on the left hand side, we have the pre-state of the transition. And on the right side, we have the post-state, right? And so it's more clear to see what's going on, right? And the first uh, return scenario is an execution where with a network with two nodes where the system stutters forever, right? But we can then explore alternatives interactively. So we have a new fork button that allows us to ask for a different execution that is equal up to the present state, but that uh, is different in the future, right? And if we press this button, we get a trace where the non initiator node answers with an echo as expected, right, for this particular configuration. And you can also ask for an execution for a different configuration with the new config button. And if we press this, we get an execution for a network with three nodes. So we can use these buttons to check if your model is well specified, right? But you can also directly ask for specific scenarios. For example, this run command asks for an execution where the protocol runs to completion in a complete network with three nodes. So after validation, we can verify properties. Again, we can use the transitive closure to specify that the parent relation forms a spanning tree of the network. And then we can ask to check this assertion with a scope of four nodes. And the alloy analyzer will, by default, check all possible configurations up to, the, to this scope, right? We can also impose a scope on the number of steps that are explored. And this special one dot dot scope triggers the, what we call the complete model checking backend that checks an arbitrary number of steps. Unfortunately, when we verify the, this property, we get a counterexample. And by pressing the new config, you can see that this problem only occurs on two very specific uh, networks, right? And even for these networks, if the initiator was in a different node, it already worked OK, right? So if manually checking this, I'm pretty sure we'll probably for forget these two, these two configurations. And probably the bug will not be detected. And uh, implementation later will fail someday. I don't know. So does this mean that uh, the protocol is really incorrect? Well, well, not really. So what happens is that in the paper, in a different part of the paper, uh, Shang uh, states that we must assume that initiator is to be considered visited a priori, right? It's not clear what this means, right? But I think we could guess that it should follow the same rules as the nodes that already have a parent, right? And, uh, but this is a detail that we could have uh, missed, right? And, uh, and we, if we don't check our spec for all possible configurations, this, this bug will probably go undetected, right? And here is a fix in it predicate where you specify that the initiator right of the parent is itself. And with this change, all the properties old as expected. And here are the times the analyzer took to check all configurations up to a given scope, right? So it's actually very fast at checking correctness is faster than TLC. And it can check all networks up to six nodes in 13 minutes, which I think is very, very good because there are a lot of possible networks, okay? But for ver verifying the termination property is very slow. Some final remarks to conclude. So when designing software with complex configurations, I think formal methods are even more desirable, right? Because uh, they can help us detect problems that occur only in very specific uh, configurations. So I hope I have convinced you that lightweight formal methods are not so difficult to use and they are already quite effective, to some extent at least. So if your system is really complex and you fail to develop a nice abstract model, what's going to happen is that model checking will be super slow or even unfeasible, right? So abstraction is the key, right? So TLA Plus is great for behavioral design. It was a great inspiration for us when we developed Alloy 6. So um, it doesn't have native support to check multiple configurations at once, but there's a technique to do that. It's not too difficult to apply if the configurations are 
simple and it's also very fast at verifying properties in that case. So I think the biggest issue with TLA Plus is lack of support for validation, right? It's very difficult to validate your specs. But on the plus side, it has many diversified analysis techniques. So it has a proper support for refinement. Like I said, it has a proof system that you can use to develop an unbounded proof. So there's more maturity to this formal method when compared to Alloy. So of course, I'm very suspicious, but I think Alloy 6 is great for both structural and behavioral design. So by default, it checks all configurations at once, and it can be very, very fast at checking invariants. But unfortunately, it's still quite slow at checking other properties, in particular liveness properties. But one of his main advantages is the excellent support for validation. But for me, the biggest advantage is actually the everything is a relation motto, which I think in my perspective drives users to develop really nice abstract models, right? So, and in design, I think the main challenge is to develop good abstractions, right? So, namely, we want to take really complex concepts and make them simple to to understand and analyze. And that's all. Thanks for listening. <laughs>